Good morning. I want to welcome you this morning or this afternoon or the evening, whether you're watching or on a treadmill or driving in a car to the podcast, there's always a way. And man, you talk about a loaded show and you talk about a guest uh, that I've been looking forward to really two guests, one guest looking forward to getting to know. And the other one is someone that is, is made an impression and an imprint on my life. Uh, and I kid a lot, joke a lot, but there's very few folks uh, that I have been influenced by as much as I have uh, our guest, uh, Josh McDowell. Josh McDowell and Bill Bennett have written a new book. Now, most of you, if you're like me, had to add to your libraries, you know, get extensions because of all the books Josh has written. But this is a new one. It's collaborative. And he and Ben, it's entitled Free to Thrive. And so we're going to delve into that. But first, I want to welcome uh, Josh McDowell. Josh, it is great to see you today, buddy. Well, it means we're both up and kicking. Yes. And, and that's quite an accomplishment, by the way. Well, you know, every day when I get out of bed <clears throat> and my feet hit the floor, somebody says to me, when are you going to retire? I said, when I wake up, I roll out of bed, my feet hit the floor and Satan doesn't shake. Man. Yeah. Well, amen and FM. Well, Josh, your ministry uh, obviously has been built to last. Uh, I followed you from the first days I gave my life to the Lord uh, in the Jesus movement. I was exposed early on. Uh, I think a big Explo event, uh, first time I was at a significant gathering, uh, and you were talking about the need for us not only to know Jesus, but who he was, and uh, of course that famous line that, 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 that you have uh, uh provided for every preacher in the world, probably, that he's either liar or he's Lord or he's lunatic, you know, you got to make a decision. And then the evidence that demands a verdict and then more evidence that demands a verdict. For me personally, just starting to speak on college campuses, a little paperback called More Than a Carpenter yeah. absolutely rocked my world. So for a Jesus freak, that got saved out of methamphetamine and all the broken homes, all the nonsense. Uh, your books, Josh, in all seriousness, help me have a solid foundation. First time I ever even heard of the term biblical worldview. First time anyone ever told me I needed to have evidence for what I believe. So it is really a pleasure to see you once again and, and have you on today. Well, this is like dying and going to heaven, <laughs> but I see you're really smart. You're so good. putting two of my books right up there on the hey. shelf. You went out and bought them today and put them right up there. I'm impressed. First of all, thank the Lord for Amazon. That's all I can say. Uh, That's right. <laughs> they got in late last night, right, <clears throat> on, right on time. Uh, one reason is, uh, Josh, uh, when we, I'm, I'm working very closely with Charleston Southern University, and we've established a school with three majors, three minors for online uh, education, biblical worldview, youth ministry, and strategic leadership. And our rule for every class that we have is that the books you're going to be required to read for the class are the kind of books that are going to be on your shelf forever. You know, these are the books that will make an imprint and impact on your life. And so in all seriousness, I've had those books uh, for uh, a long time. Uh, and so I'm, I'm just excited about material that people can go to over and over again. And I, I really believe, especially some of the areas that you and Ben talk about in Free to Thrive is going to be one of those books because... Uh, there's cultural wars going on, and our students are literally being in a tsunami of, of, of change and attack. And this is, I believe, I believe has potential to be, if not one of the two or three best, the best book for youth ministers to read, especially at this time. So tell I hope me this is being recorded. It is all recorded. <laughs> Good, because I want to repeat that over and over again. Well, Josh, uh, <laughs> you've been doing this a long time, so we'll, we'll kick it off. Uh, you know, Josh, I, I must tell you, 
I, I heard about you also when the first time I ever went to Russia and they didn't give anybody the time of day of faith, but yet somehow your name came up and was mentioned. And through my trips to Russia, I've been blown away. I mean, you've received several of the highest honors that uh, the Russian government could give to a Russian, much less an American evangelical talking about Jesus. So, uh, you know, Josh, I, I just admire the depth of your ministry and the scope of your ministry. And what I want to begin with today is this is called There's Always a Way. And if there's one person I know that I'm interested in wanting to know what's the first thing that would come to Josh McDowell's mind when he hears the phrase, there's always a way. Is it God's will? There's always a way to do wrong things, right? Evil things. So first thing that comes to my mind, is it God's will? Wow. And I love that. We haven't heard that. We've asked a lot of people uh, that question, gotten a lot of remarkable insights and answers. But man, that is a uh, that is a sobering thought. Well, you know, I think if we go through life with a conviction and the emotion that we're doing God's will for our life, there's no way you could be a happier, more fulfilled person in life. Mm is knowing that you're in the center of God's will. And then the next thing I would say to you, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And uh, I know when I face insurmountable tasks that become surmountable, I always realize I cannot do it in my own strength. Hmm. No, I got a lot of individual strength. I mean, I've, I've got enough, uh, I'm educated beyond my intelligence. Uh, I've done my homework, everything else, but even then we've got to reach out and trust in Christ to live through us. Well, absolutely. I want to welcome Ben Bennett. Ben, uh, you and I've had a chance to ch uh, chat a few moments. I've known about you, known about many of your projects, your, uh, your writings, your works, uh, and what an unusual combination. I mean, here's a young man who's literally I believe plugged into the culture and really uh, uh, helping us read the tea leaves and in, in, in making forecasts and helping young people handle all this stuff that's coming at them. But yet at the, at the same time, uh, you not only are reaching students, but you've spent so much time providing material and content. And so I thought when I saw the title, Free to Thrive, that immediately got my attention. But then when I realized more who you were, and then realize, of course, you know, what all Josh brings to a particular issue. I thought, man, what an exciting combination. So Ben, I want to welcome you. You and Josh partnered on this book. I'm going to ask how that idea came about and partnership came about. But Ben, what is the very first thing you think of when you hear the phrase, with your background, your experience, when you hear the phrase, there's always a way? Yeah, well, first, thanks so much for having us on, on the show. It's great to be uh, with you, all the podcast show, if you're watching. Um, but when I think of there is always a way, I think of no matter how stuck you feel, no matter how much pain there is in, in your past, no matter how much anxiety, depression, hopelessness, uh, struggles, addiction you're dealing with, there always is a way. Uh, the Christian worldview, Jesus, uh, the Holy Spirit living inside of us um, gives us the, the answers, the, the, the path. I, I think of um, you make known to me the path of life in uh, Psalm 1610, I believe it is. And there, there is always a way we have the path of life and Jesus reveals that to us. And often he does that through um, others' help. Uh, not not self-help, other help, other people, inviting them in, uh, resources, pastors, therapists, mentors, people who can help walk alongside of us and, and help us see a way through. Well, wow. Thank you for that. I told you earlier uh, when we were visiting, I refer to you as the guy that makes, makes sure all these young men and women that are out there in youth ministry and Christian education and some of us that have been around for a while, 
you're the kind of guy that makes sure we have five smooth stones in our slingshot. And uh, Josh has done that for many, many years with his books and his research uh, and his lectures and presentations. But some of the issues that you've really focused on are some of those that really hasn't, haven't received the, a lot of light in Christian ministry. And that's what I love so much about what you've done, because obviously it is ministry. If we're going to be made whole, if we're going to shake off the dust and make peace with our past, then obviously we need some real, we need some real answers and we need some real practical steps. And that's what this book, Free to Thrive, is all about. How did you, how did you and Josh meet and how did this concept come about? <sighs> Well, Josh and I, um, let's see, I was in the campus ministry of, of crew for about six years. And of course, Josh was part of it, had his own ministry a lot longer. And uh, I, I was doing work with college students, with campus directors. So many people are struggling with so many different things. And uh, so I started leading these, these year-long healing groups where we combined a lot of biblical uh, answers and research with brain science and psychological findings and and you know god was just setting people free left and right i started speaking and writing and, and that was still just a part-time thing and so i started to one of my mentors encouraged me to start making more connections and so um for a while i was thinking josh mcdowell i need to reach out to josh mcdowell but i know he's busy he's got a lot on his plate so i've got to have something good to say and um so just a lot of <laughs> yeah a lot of processing, uh, asking, you know, for discernment from, from God, from, from others. And one day I was driving, I think I've told you this, Josh, I'm pretty sure. One day I was driving in my car. It was about a month after God laid it on my heart to reach out to Josh. And I uh, was just kind of thinking about what was next and kind of long-term in life and ministry. And um, it, it's, it was like an impression. It, it clicked reach out to Josh, pitch the idea of working together and, and reaching people all over the world, helping them get set free. And um, that's what happened. Reached out to Josh and he so graciously responded to this guy that he didn't know. Um, and we met and then started working together. And the book is, is one of the many products of that. Josh, what do you think about that term, free to thrive? That's an unusual term, by the way. And, and, and also, I have to ask, Josh, when I hear people that have know, you, you know your work and know what you've done and, and love, love what you've done, have said this could be the best apologetic book out there. I'm going, wait a minute, we got evidence that demands a verdict, more evidence that demands a verdict. We got more than a carpenter. You can't much be more evidence that demands a verdict. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, we got to keep Sean going, you know, keep him busy. But uh, I, 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 what is it about this book in the way you address, I love what the title says, how your hurt, struggles, and deepest longings can lead to a fulfilling life interesting hurt and struggles, but also our deepest longings. So Josh, how can this be such a practical book over some real sticky issues, if you'll let me use that term, but yet at the same time, people saying, man, that's one of the greatest apologetic books I've read. I think the way it came about in my life is probably one of the best answers to that. Um, over the years, I've been, my heart's been broken so many times with, I don't like to call them Christian leaders, Christian influencers falling by the wayside morally, sexually, divorce, finances. And I would call so many of them. I wanted to find out, is there a common denominator or anything? And the thing I walked away with over the years is that almost every one of them had had deeper hurts or longings that they had not dealt with. Hmm. And if you don't heal them, you live them. If you don't heal your deeper hurts and longings, you will live them out because it'll lead to poor behavior. And so I realized there needs to be something done to get people 
to deal with the, all of us have been hurt. All of us have little hurts. It's often little phrases, and I'll give an illustration of my own life. Uh, it's often a little phrase that causes damage when you get older. And if you don't deal with that, it'll destroy you. Your ministry will fail everything. For example, when I was about nine, 10 years old, I was walking out to the barn with my father. He was sober at the time. Well, kind of half sober, half drunk, because if he'd been sober, he wouldn't have said this. And he said, you know, you were really an unwanted child. All you're good for is to work the fields. I mean, Jay, wow. that hit me like a plant. I still, I still can recall the emotion of it, of that very moment. And from that time on, my life became one of, of trying to be productive to help people reach their goals and everything. Because as long as I said yes to people's hurts and needs, I was a loving person. But as soon as I said no to someone, I became an unloving person. Hmm. And this is what happened in my life. Because I felt the only way I could be accepted is to perform. So every time somebody would ask me to do something, to help them, whatever, I would always say yes. I remember I'd get phone calls, somebody needing something, wanting me to help them. And Dottie would be in the background saying, say no, say no, say no. And I'd always say yes. But here was my problem. I was saying yes with my mind. I was saying no with my heart. And when the Bible said in Corinthians, that your yea be yea and your nay be nay, I was breaking that biblical principle. Hmm. What that means, when you give a yea with your mind, let it be a yea with your heart. If you say a nay with your mind, let it be a nay with your heart. I would often say no to someone finally, and then I'd feel guilty. I'm not a loving person. I should have done it, etc. And one of the first things I had to do was realize that God accepts me just the way I am. I'm not what I used to be. I'm not what I ought to be, but I'm not what I'm going to be. But God wants me to enjoy the process. And so the first thing I had to do was get into the scriptures. And I had to see and I wrote a book on this called See Yourself as God Sees You. I had to see how does God see me? He sees me loved. He sees me forgiven. He sees me totally accepted. He sees me significant. Hmm. And then I thought, Jay, hmm. if I don't accept myself the way God accepts me, then I'm saying I have a higher standard a higher opinion than God does. Whoa, that's dangerous. And it didn't happen overnight, Jay. Little, little by the process. So the people that helped me was a man by the name of Bob Beal, uh, Dr. Henry Cloud. Uh, but most of all, it was my wife. But when I first met Ben, I looked at him and said, wow, he's different. Not just with the tattoos and everything, but his attitude is the way he looked at things. And I basically, and I think I've told Ben this, Ben has probably became one of the most authentic people I've ever met. Hmm. And if I'd have one message for Ben, never change. God created you to be you and me to be me. And if you're not you, and I'm not me, who in the world is going to be us? Every person is a gift of God to the body of Christ. And if you're not who God created you to be, not somebody else, then you're robbing the world of a special gift from God. And uh, so I saw that in Ben's life, he had a lot of different issues in childhood than I had. He makes my life look like the rosiest life in heaven. Uh, and yet, 
through Christ, he found a way to become free to live out a thriving life, to be all that God intended him to do. What well, God was doing the same thing in my life. And for me, I thought, wow, if there's anyone I could do a book with right now, and I only think about doing books, not to have another book out, but is there something that will really help people? I mean, if, some, if you spend all this time in agony and it doesn't help people, it's worthless. And so we teamed up and did free to thrive. Well, Josh, you were very transparent. You talked about some things. I've known you a long time and uh, uh, that, that I didn't realize you'd wrestled with or gone through. But I'm going to tell you, it was one of the most refreshing things uh, and now knowing, uh, and by the way, I, I loved what you and Sean did together when you were, I think he interviewed you about some of the high profile individuals that were friends to many of us. That it was we, Ravi Zacharias. Exactly. You know, and the way you handled all of that, but uh, read, reading about it in the book, what you've gone through, uh, I just... Uh, I just want to thank you for that transparency because I'm convinced uh, that's the only way we're going to make it. That's the only way our marriages thrive. That's the only way uh, our ministry is going to thrive. And uh, I, I just thought you handled that. Uh, and coming from you, it, it, it meant a lot. I also am a little fascinated. I want to get main thing I want to talk about. I circled this to myself because I'm so ADD uh, about the seven longings, the way you, you broke them down in the book. But Ben, I'm, I must ask you to follow up with, Josh has shared a couple of those pains that were a permanent almost if the Lord hadn't begun to intervene and, and he recognized them and acknowledged them and, and received help and grace from them. Uh, somebody went through a lot of abandonment and sexual abuse and called everything in the book. I, 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 I relived a lot on these pages. But Ben, I want to just ask you, uh, what was it in your life that kind of brought you to where you've spent so much time focusing on, on what I call real needs that hardly anybody wants to address, especially in the faith world? Yeah, Jay, I would, I would say, you know, growing up surrounded by Christianity, I uh, met Jesus at a young age, real young, had a real personal relationship with him. But I dealt with a lot of other broken relationships. Uh, one in particular was with my dad. He was just so angry growing up, often would, would go off in, in states of rage, uh, name calling, bullying. I experienced those things from him. And in addition to that, I was bullied by my friends. So early on, I just had this deep, unmet longing for acceptance, for safety, and uh, that was often not met. So I didn't feel safe. I felt rejected. And I just started developing mental health issue, issues, anxiety, depression, OCD, as it relates to my faith, being obsessed with um, whether or not I'm actually saved and half of the time being convinced that I'm going to die and, and go to hell and spend eternity there, that God's going to reject me too. And eventually I got addicted to pornography, got addicted to food. And that lasted throughout my, my teenage years. And so I had this, this deep sense of, of hurt, of rejection, of what I would call shame, that this idea that there's something wrong with me at the core of my being. And it wasn't until uh, even after college, you know, in college, I was, I was involved in uh, ministry and, and growing spiritually, but my spiritual life was having little impact on my emotional and relational life. And I didn't have this holistic understanding. I didn't know the depth of my pain and my hurt and how I needed to be healed emotionally and how uh, I needed to be healed relationally and to, instead of being rejected so much and not feeling safe, what I needed in the present was that safety in relationships, uh, that safety with God and to, and to focus on that. So it was through... Uh, after graduating college and, and getting involved in, in recovery and studying the scriptures as it relates to this and having great counselors that I started to, and great men in my life who supported me every day, that's when I started to really work through some of these deeper hurts, the deeper unresolved issues that 
um, I thought I had left in the past, but I had actually buried alive because they were coming out in so many different ways. And that's when Jesus really began to set me free from many of these different uh, issues. And I started working with other people, started doing a lot in, in uh, HR role and working with um, college students, campus directors, and seeing people set free. And um, that has a lot of what I went through has led me to the, the passion today to help um, other people be restored to who God created them to be. And often that happens by rather than just condemning our struggles, starting to question them, asking, what is this about? Why do I do this? What am I longing for? Where has this gone unmet? And I, I really believe that questioning those struggles and, and looking at our life actually can be the roadmap that uh, leads us towards healing once we start to realize the deficits we have and what we're truly longing for that God wants to provide through himself and others. Wow. Josh, I bet as y'all work through the book, uh, some of these conversations you'd had with men that you loved and respected and brothers that had really the wheels began to come off, you began to realize the correlation between that there's a lot of that inner pain and a lot of that, uh, uh, what I call the hurt and the dirt that we just carry around with us. Well, I think most influencers that have an impact, a lot of that came out of dealing with hurts in their lives hmm. because of what they went through. They can identify with, um, with others, but something I learned is most people, especially men and most Christian influencers, leaders don't have other people that they allow to speak into their lives. They become very individualistic and I would call it pride. Uh, most of our problems started with people. Most of our solutions start with people. Most of our problems started with hurting relationships. Most of our solutions start with positive relationships, all centered around Christ. And when I look at my life, if I hadn't been able to trust other people to speak into my life, I would have bombed out years ago. Jay, there were three people that I trusted in my life. One was Bob Beal. Do you know Bob? Yes, sir. Bob Beal. That man spent so much time with me, poured his life into me, gave me biblical principles that I couldn't be who I am today without a friend like Bob Beal and his influence in my life. Second, Dr. Henry Cloud. Uh, <laughs> I called Henry up. I was at the top of my game, as you could say, in the human thing. Right. All over the world, people reading my books, giving talks, everything. And yet I knew I had a problem. I knew I had a problem. I didn't know what it was. And I knew I needed help. Hmm. And so I called up uh, Dr. Cloud, Henry, who was already a good friend of mine. And uh, I said, Henry... There's a problem in Camelot. I mean, people kind of looked at me as Camelot, doing well, riding high, books out there, everything. But there was a problem within the walls. And I said, I need a coach. Can you help me? And for about a year and a half, every trip I made home, I went up and spent one to two hours with Henry. And the interesting thing of Henry is, one, first he listened. Then he spoke scripture into my life. And I thought I knew the meaning of most scripture. Oh, my gosh. Henry would say, well, this is what it means. I go, wow, that's totally different. And he would speak truth into my life. And the other was my wife, Dottie. Dottie came from a very secure home. Um, her parents... Uh, just modeled love and commitment and acceptance to each other and to their children. And I always say that one of the things that drew me to Dottie were her parents. I'd never heard anyone talk about their mom and dad 
in such a loving and positive way as I heard Dottie from the first time I met her. Well, with my background, with my parents, I didn't even think that was possible in this life. And I thank God I married Dottie. Hmm. Because when she says things to me, now I wish I did, but often I react. But I usually come around. But I'm so appreciative hmm. of my wife. Uh, the way she's had input into my life. And without Dottie, I don't think I could have the relational impact I have today in speaking without Dottie's input into my life. Those three people. And I think one of the most important thing, whether you're an influencer, a leader, a follower, whatever you are, is to realize you can't go it alone. You need others in your life. And uh, I think I'm a walking example of that. Wow. And uh, several times I've written Bob and, and uh, Henry notes, thanking them for their input into my life. And I think after this talk, I'm going to write them another, <clears throat> another note. And I'm sure, Jay, I followed you closely. You became, to me, the most powerful voice in the Southern Baptist Convention. And through so many thousands of pastors, you've had an impact all over the world. And I'd like to know, are there, were there other people in your life that you trusted that spoke into your life to become who you are? Well, well, thank you for that, Josh. Come from you. That means uh, more than I can say. The, uh, yes, I was privileged. Uh, you know, the Jesus movement had many pluses. But there was also some sideshows that were uh, in the traveling ensemble, right? Uh, you, so there was uh, the, the yak woman in the other tent or something. I mean, you know, it was just a weird menagerie, if you will. But yet I had this profound real experience. But I, I realized I, I couldn't, I didn't do well at school, dropped out of school many times. It was when finally the college, Charleston Southern, uh, took me on academic probation. I've been turned down by 13 colleges. And, uh, and so they, they get, and I tell them that's my love language, academic probation. But uh, <laughs> so in the course of it, there were some subjects I scored below plant life on, <laughs> and there were other subjects I scored off the map. And they said, something's wrong. Jay, either, either you've got some issues or you're cheating, one of the two. And so they, they really spent a lot of research on me and time, money, found out I was very dyslexic. This is back in the day when no one knew about that. And that I was just to be Captain Obvious a minute, uh, miss a little A, D, 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 D. And so they began to really help me and mold me. But none of that would have happened had it not been for me being turned down by all these colleges and my and the young lady that I was dating at the time, and we met and we've been, we just had our 49th anniversary uh, oh. we met in the Jesus movement. But so she said to me, she said, you know, I noticed there's an ad in the paper for an extension course from Stetson University on the Old Testament. And then there's gonna be another one on the New Testament. Why don't you and I go take that course together and I'll help you with it. And, 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 and so as I sat there, I had hair to my shoulders. And here is this uh, THD from New Orleans Seminary, Southern Baptist uh, missionary, if you will. And he's teaching the class. And here I sit on the front row, uh, sandals, uh, you know, long hair, this freak. And I love scripture. And I'm, I'm doing my best to take notes. And so he started taking me out after class. And uh, I thought, man, this old dude's lonely. And Diane and I'd go with him, but I'd, I'd never heard of mentoring. I'd never heard of discipling. But this man mentored me and discipled me, helped me get through these two courses so that there I had something to show to a college. I can do college work, you know, and, and, and here's, and I want, I want a chance. He's the one who went to bat for me at the university. He recommended me to a little country church, 19 members. And uh, I went and pastored that church for two years and then went to college. So Dr. Fred Williams was the man early on 
that really just spoke truth to me and counseled us, you know, you got to give the first 10% to the Lord, then you save 10%, you live off 80. I mean, some of those things, corny things that we'd heard a hundred times, those were monumental for us. So, and then there's been, and by the way, I almost said when I picked up the book and saw that uh, Henry Ford uh, had, I mean, Henry Cloud, excuse me, had written the Ford, <laughs> but you had me at, at that because I'm a huge uh, Henry Cloud man. So he has had that effect with his books uh, in sessions that I've heard. Uh, he's greatly ministered to me. And there's another gentleman I think you know well named uh, Dr. David Ferguson. Ah, <laughs> yes. He looks out a different window. And I'm telling you. <laughs> From so, a different floor. No, no question. And he and I have done programs together in Africa, all over the Middle East. And, but he has really taught me a lot about making peace with your past and dealing with the hurt and the dirt. And, you know, he, he's really been one of those uh, three men in my life. So I would say those three men. And then, of course, I learned a long time ago, the secret sauce to life is the ability to build meaningful, lasting, positive relationships. And I've been very, very grateful for the handful of men that I have in my life. Somebody that you know quite well, Jack Graham's one of my closest friends in the world. And, and I've got a, a, a group of friends and we'll get together once or twice a year where I mean, we'll kick each other right in the biscuits. I mean, we'll, we'll say that's the dumbest thing I've ever, I mean, you know, we have that kind of real relationship and that band of brothers has also helped me beyond even what those three instrumental men did in my life. What was the professor's name that had an impact in your life? Dr. Fred Williams. My Fred Williams, the man by the name of Dr. Robert Sosi. Hmm. Uh, I think every theology professor's seminary professor should always think each year there's one or two people I can pour my life into. You can't do it much more than that. And select one or two people every year. And I think you'd say the same. I got more out of seminary from sitting in that office, going out to coffee with Robert Sosi than I did in all my classes. All my classes helped. Yep. But it was that relationship, as you brought out, no question. that brought it home to me and where I learned. Well, well, I... I didn't expect to go down that road, but I'm glad we did because it's real and it's healing and it's helpful. And it kind of lets all of us know there's hope for every one of us. And even those of us with titles and, and, you know, pedigrees and all the other things that we think kind of make us, uh, we need each other in this work. And, and I'm going to circle back around if I might for a minute, Ben, because Again, I, I have it highlighted here so big, I have to, even my ADD have to notice it. Uh, but the, I was really touched by the seven longings. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, you read, you read them and you go, well, it, yeah, of course. those. But I don't know what it was about it, but the way it was presented, it is, I believe, one of the most profound sections of any book out there. How did, how did that come about the way you, you two broke it down on the seven longings? Yeah, Jay, that was something Josh and I started thinking about as we set out to write this, this book. We were thinking, okay, how, what is the foundation um, of, of all of this we see in Scripture? How can we kind of systematize it to really help people get this? And we started to um, realize, and after meeting with different uh, therapists and, and counselors like Dr. Henry Cloud and, and neuroscientists and and just as we were meeting with pastors, we kept thinking about uh, felt needs and um, what, what's going on in, in this generation. And we were thinking about our own life and our own stories. And then I, rem I, I remember one day setting to sitting down to write one of the outlines thinking, oh, my gosh, um, the wh what if we got into desires? What if we got into these longings of the hearts? Uh, okay, let's look, let's look into what's out there. Let's look, look into what scripture says about this. And through months of, of, of processing and looking at the scriptures, we narrowed down to these seven longings that are these 
seven persistent cravings of the heart that we see all throughout scripture that are mainly uh, relational needs intended to be met in our relationship with God and others, but that actually lead to such a, a thriving life, a flourishing life. And one of the things that as we were putting this together and researching that really stood out to me was I came across a study done by Harvard and uh, it had been going on for about eight decades, 80 years. And they were looking at what leads to the happiest and healthiest lives. And the current head of the study was interviewed when they were doing it. And, and they were like, okay, so, so, so what is it? What do you have to say about this study? And the, the current head of the study said, by and large, good relationships keep us happier and healthier, period. In fact, the way, he, going, the way he responded, he said, oh, that's easy. It's relationships, relationships, relationships. And, and I'm going... They gave us this answer for free. It's been going on 80 years. This is it. And, and then part of me was also going, well, duh. That's what, if we look at the Garden of Eden, that's how God designed us. Mm -hmm. So these seven longings meant to be fulfilled in relationships and, and sociology and research backs up that we need good relationships uh, with God and others. And, and that's what the seven longings leads to. But we know, man, those go unmet so easily. We experience rejection rather than acceptance. We experience a lack of safety, danger rather than safety. Uh, people who are supposed to be there, who's supposed to enter our worlds, especially as kids growing up, often don't just in this fallen world. And that takes a toll on us. Wow. You know, uh, I'm going to, Josh and I, uh, spent a lot of our lives on uh, college campuses. I followed Josh's example and really tried to devote to high school campuses because I felt like they already had uh, Alexander the Great, you know, doing the colleges, you know. So I was at a, a really focus on speaking in high schools, some 10,000 high schools. And, I've, and my message was pretty simple. There's a battle for your mind. There's a battle for your body. There's a battle for your future, which was your soul, but I wouldn't love to talk about that in public schools. And there's a battle for your family. You know, those, those four great battles in a bottle pill, cheap thrill. And I talk about abuse and some of those things. I want to ask you, and of course, uh, Josh had to respond to so many issues that were happening on campuses. And as you know, our campuses sometimes are the epicenter of some of these issues that become in the forefront, right? Some of these uh, things that make us uneasy and unrest and, uh, and, and, and sometimes even revolt, that the, these underlying things have been going on in campuses for a while. So I want to ask you, uh, what were a couple, and I love, Josh, that you have, uh, excuse me, Ben, that you and Josh have come together because you deal with some things that frankly haven't been addressed in a lot of uh, theology books are apologetic books. I mean, you, you deal with them head on. And I want to just ask you, uh, are there a couple of events that you believe have kind of really shaped where our young people are at at this moment as you look at it? I know you know what some of those challenges are, but I'm, I'm always trying to put my finger on what caused so much of this in so many people. And in my life, you know, we had the Vietnam War and we had the Kennedy assassination and we had Robert Kennedy, you know, we had these kind of, we had Woodstock, we had these big kind of moments. What do you think, Ben, I'll ask you first, uh, have been a couple of the moments that, uh, that put young people in the shape they're in right now? Absolutely, Jay. I'd say one, one of them, it was, it was a moment that has led to so many other moments. And I'd say that's the advent of the internet and that um, especially high-speed internet and the developing of the iPhone where we're constantly hearing and we're constantly bombarded with, with news, with tragedies, with this is going on in, in that part of the world, this is going on here. People are saying, some people are saying this, some people are saying this. Um, and that adds just so much confusion of, well, it's, it's kind of safe to not have a truth. It's kind of safe to be in the middle, to not have an opinion, because then I won't offend anybody. I, I think that's 
one of the things that has led to such a, this idea that your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. Because people don't want to offend people because they think that, that truth is offensive um, rather than truth is reality. Uh, that would be one, one of the things that I think has young people have grown up experiencing that has led to one of their worldviews. Uh, another thing I would say with the internet is just the um, explosiveness of the amount of pornography out there and how violent it is, how abusive it is. I came across a study last night um, that was on, on teens and about both half of uh, male and female teens both said that they thought pornography uh, and what it is, mainstream, violence, uh, abuse, coercion, that that is what sex is, is about. That shaped their worldview on, on sex. Uh, another thing I, I would say is that, and Barna came out with a study a couple of years ago that teenagers today, young people and college students, only 4% of them in the U.S. have a biblical worldview. So we see kind of this um, growing up in this society opinions all over the place, being exposed to them, wanting to be safe in the middle, not to have an opinion, being exposed to all of this stuff uh, online. Yeah, pornography, but there's also violence and we're seeing all kinds of, of, of things online and, and people's opinions and hate and canceling each other and lack of a biblical worldview, lack of a foundation. Those three events have just I would say negatively, it, it, the negative things about um, our culture today, uh, about young people today, um, they've been infiltrated with those three things. While there are so many positive things, those I would say are, are some of the negative things that, that have um, influenced and hurt and led to so much pain and, and, and confusion. Um, but with that, there's, there's also positive things. With the internet, I think about the amount of young people who are taking a stand online. I think about TikTok. I've got, uh, I'm, I'm on TikTok, so many friends reaching youth on TikTok. And there's so many Christian youth who have a biblical worldview, who believe in the truth, um, who have come to know Jesus through, through TikTok and are outspoken about their faith and outspoken about truth and trying to shine a positive message amidst all of, of the darkness and, and violence and and works of evil that we're seeing online. So um, technology, the, the smartphone, advent of the internet is definitely being used for good in the lives of so many uh, young Christians. Those uh, two-sided swords seem to exist in every generation. You know, Jake, they cause great harm and great good. Yes, Doc? I think what Ben said there about the problem is the best analysis I've ever heard. I've heard analysis from everyone. And uh, thanks, Ben. Uh, I even grabbed my cell phone and started taking notes. <laughs> but it was good. But if somebody hey, said to me, what is one thing that has changed history almost more than anything else? The cell phone. Big time. The cell phone. And most of us don't realize what has happened through good, bad, and ugly with the cell phone. Thank you. That was the best analysis I've ever heard. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, I, would, I would agree. It was it was uh, oh, insightful and spot on. Josh, you better I'm double his honorarium. Oh, I <laughs> plan on it. In fact, uh, next time I'm just going to bring... No, I'm kidding. But anyway, the one thing I want to say before the time gets away from us, I want every pastor... Please hear me on this. I believe the greatest things you could do as a senior pastor is to get your key young men and, and start with your young men if you're a male pat, you know, but get your key young men and walk through this with your staff. Walk through this book with your staff because it's got so much that those of us that believe in the fundamentals of the faith, I mean, this book is the kind of book that everyone that has a strong biblical worldview is going to go, hey, I'm, you know, I, I, want, I want to find out what these guys think. But I promise you, as you work through some of those as a staff, it may be one of the most liberating things and one of the most insightful things you could do 
uh, for your church and for the ministry of your church. So free to thrive, Josh McDowell, it's a young man I'm trying to help get started, and Ben Bennett, all right? And I promise you, this book is an apologetic for the soul. In closing, Josh, I need to ask you a couple of big questions. What would you say? I love the word. That was goal for me. What you said that every theology teacher and everyone who teaches uh, ministry or preaching or youth ministry, that word you gave was profound. What is true youth meaning, youth ministry? Josh, your years, you've devoted your life to reaching a generation, and then we just kept growing old with our generation, right? But we, we've been involved with a lot of generations. But what would you say is the heart of youth ministry as you look into the face of those and, and, and the ears of those? And then what do you believe they could do to really transform a generation? The harder purpose of youth ministry is to ingrain truth in the lives of young people that produces growth out of a loving relationship. What more can there be? The youth pastor has our youth more than has the people that have access to our youth as parents, teachers, and youth pastors. Those three. Uh, and what was your second question on youth pastor? Um, well, on ministry, what would you encourage youth pastors to do to help their students develop a biblical worldview? You're not ready to be a youth pastor until you're married and have one or two children. I really would. Um, I would say to youth pastors, and I would say probably half of them are married, one. A loving, close, intimate relationship with your spouse is the start of youth ministry. Unless your youth want what you have, you could spend your whole life teaching and it won't take effect. Hmm. It's be what you're teaching. Be who you are. Be authentic. This is why I like Ben. He's just authentic. He, you get what you see and you see what you get with Ben. Well, this is what we need with youth pastors. Be authentic. And I would say with youth pastors, maybe once a year, you ought to go on a, uh, a retreat for marriages, a marriage retreat. Because you have so many things as youth pastor pulling against you. And always bring it back into focus and we usually need others to do that wow so if you have a beautiful fulfilled marriage and relationship with your children every youth that you ever meet is going to want what you have man that's why he's the man isn't it ben that's why he's the man ben let me ask that's you it. the same question from your perspective uh what you went through, and of course, you minister to a lot of folks, a lot of young, a lot of youth pastors, and and uh, Christian educators, and even those uh, educators in public schools. They're always looking for a way or understanding. How would you describe youth? What would you say to those that are really kind of the gatekeepers for this generation? It's a great question, Jay. I've actually been on a couple projects working on research and, and developing different tools and um, kind of ideologies as to how to reach Gen Z specifically. And, and by and large, um, there's a couple things I, I think of that I would say. One is that you can't give what you don't have. And you can't give what you don't have. And I feel like so many of us in ministry, what can happen is we start to lose our first love think about that was the only criticism of the churches in Rev revelation they lost their first love what they were what we are doing for god can start to try and supersede being with god in our relationship with god and our relationship with others and first we have to take the time to say am i healthy am i spiritually healthy with god am i 
emotionally healthy? Am I dealing with my stuff? Am I relationally healthy? Um, because we have to not just, as, as Josh has said for years, not just uh, practice what we preach, but preach what we're actually practicing. May everything we're doing in ministry be an outflow of what God is doing here in us. And uh, so often he does st stuff through us after doing stuff in us. Second thing I, I would say is um, with, with the, the, the shifts in just this generation and, and cultures, we need to ask a lot more questions, the questions about rather than just presenting, okay, do you want to get to heaven? and uh, presenting the gospel, we need to start with asking people questions. What do, you, what do you believe spiritually? How did you grow up spiritually? Do you think there could be some kind of um, absolute truth? And a, a lot of young people today are more concerned, less concerned about um, dying and going to heaven and, and more concerned about, whose phone is that? <laughs> I was hearing a phone reading. Okay, there we go, we're good. I think it's an announcement. Time is up. <laughs> <laughs> it's an alarm. John uh, just texted me on his phone. We got to wrap it up. We got other. No, but, okay. Uh, I do have to go, uh, Jay. Yes, sir. Uh, love you, guy. Love you. Great being with you, Ben. I always walk hey, away knowing more you. than when I sit down with you. God bless. <laughs> see you. Thanks, Josh. Go ahead, Ben. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up with this. Um, one of the things we found in, in the research with, with, with Gen Z is just growing up with a, a biblical worldview, a lot of the felt needs have shifted and the questions that young people are asking. When I think about the way I was trained in evangelism or discipleship, it was for people who had a Christian worldview. And so when I would uh, go out and talk to strangers, oftentimes I would um, just ask questions about heaven. How sure are you that when you die, you're going to go to heaven and be with God? Or, and a lot of people just thought that they got to heaven by being a good person. And then you walk through um, the, the gospel and they pray, pray to receive Christ because they want to go to heaven. Uh, and they had a Christian worldview. Well, now a lot of people are growing up without a Christian worldview. And so this, this idea of who is Jesus and wait, there's only one God, and that's new to a, a lot of people. And so we have to start um, a, way further, further back, which with talking about the Christian worldview and talking about truth and, and who Jesus is. And in addition to that, we, we found that so many young people are more concerned with life now than the next life. They are concerned about, you know, what happens after death, but um, even even Jesus talked about the kingdom is here here and now. We're not just waiting around at the rapture rest stop to, to die and go to heaven. No, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to, to Jesus, and he wants us to work for the, the betterment of our cities, the betterment of our worlds, and to bring the kingdom here and now. Eternal life starts here and now, and uh, we get to bring that message of how Jesus changes everything here and now not just in the next life and how he can set people free to thrive. He can heal their hurts. He can bring peace to the anxious, joy to the depressed, uh, acceptance and love to the abused and the addicted. And um, of course that message includes salvation. But if I look at the Greek word for heal or for salvation in the New Testament, it, it means yes, to be saved, but also means to make whole and to heal. And we've got to include those two parts in, in our message of how Jesus heals our, our soul and he makes us whole spiritually and emotionally and, and relationally as we live into his principles by the power of, of the spirit at work in us. Well, I love that. That's a great way to close. Uh, ben, I, you know, what Josh talked about, the role of marriage and how important that was, uh, I would add to that and everything you said obviously was spot on because that's what kids are really looking for, how to have a relationship that lasts and it endures and enjoys. I mean, all those, uh, all those things that so many of us, unfortunately, have maybe been deprived of uh, when growing up. But I also think what you just touched on is uh, spot on because I think the greatest way we can show 
others what's going on in us is how we treat other people. And I really do believe, and you know, I hear a lot of my friends that are committed to scripture and conservative and you know, all the things that I am, my DNA, you know, but I don't think we, sometimes I think we forget that by caring about people, you know, I mean, when, when the border, the border issue blew up about two and a half years ago, uh, I went to the border, made some four trips to the border mm -hmm. and, and got in, and, and found out they needed uh, mobile medical clinics and found out they need, and that the uh, Homeland Security and uh, uh, the Border Patrol, they all were crying for help because so many people came with so many needs. And uh, so I, I always try to encourage youth pastors, run to the roar. Don't run away from If there's an issue in a community and they've been hit hard, and it may be a community that none of your kids, you know, none of those kids come to your church or in their youth group. But we need to go be the ones that are building or helping or tutoring or mentoring or, or doing Christmas boxes. I mean, whatever those tangible ways to say, I care about you and I care about other people. Because that's, to me, the only way people can see what's on my inside is by what I do outwardly. So I'm not doing it for show. I'm not doing it for, hey, look at me or recognition. I'm just doing, if I want to be all those authentic things that you and uh, Josh dealt with so effectively and uh, free to thrive about being authentic and transparent. But that's one way we show the world what, how we really feel about people. And uh, I think that just earns us such credibility. Yeah, that's a great word. So, so true. Well, Ben, listen, uh, this has been uh, an unplanned pleasure getting to know you. You know, I knew the name. Uh, I certainly was curious about the collaboration, you know, but uh, uh, I'm telling you, man, what a, what a minister. The more I've learned, and I have a young man who helps me a great deal on our staff named Malachi O'Brien. I don't know if you've run across him. He's a trip. But he is a brilliant young guy, big social media guy. But he said, Jay, this dude is a rock star. You're going to love this. <laughs> he cares about kids and he gets it. He gets mm -hmm. it, you know. And uh, wow. so I've just had a lot of reinforcement a whole lot lately. So it's a pleasure getting to meet you. And I do hope there's so many things we can do together. And man, whatever you do, just keep on keeping on. Yeah, it's been a privilege, Jay. What what a joy it is to get, get to spend some time with you, the legend himself, Dr. Jay Strack. Appreciate all you're doing and have known about you for a while. And uh, you've just been at it for, for decades, being faithful to God, serving him, reaching youth, caring. And um, that's what my generation needs to see. People wow. who are, are at it for the long haul, faithful, trustworthy, uh, and in integrity, you know, is a huge huge theme, integrous, because we see enough. Mm. And, it, and it starts to take its toll cause a lot of questions and take its toll. And it's hurtful to see friends, to see people we look up to uh, as younger people in ministry not making it. So appreciate you so much.